How y'all doing? Yeah, good, good. I see you still working on your Southern. Y'all still picking up y'all there. <laughs> I, I must have struck a nerve in referring to English hospitality. It's not being warm. I, I was, in fact, jesting. I trust you know that. You guys have been quite warm, quite wonderful. And if there was any doubt about it at all, it was resolved for me when after my workshop, Where's my brother who came to me after the workshop and presented to me a gift from his wife who follows me on Twitter and knows that from time to time, my wife, who is normally a good woman, <laughs> turns against me, tries to hasten my death, either by taking things out of my diet or putting things in there that are inedible, <laughs> like kale. I mean, eating kale must be the dietary equivalent of having bamboo shoots pressed beneath your fingernails, right? <laughs> it's culinary waterboarding is what it is. <laughs> but she's convinced kale is a superfood. <laughs> no, 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 man. Fried chicken is a superfood. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, this, this lovely British sister, knowing my travails with kale, uh, sent her husband here bearing gifts of Oreo cookies. <laughs> which, for the record, are not only tasty, but they're vegan, too, all right? There's no animal products in here. So I usually feel proud when I'm eating such things because no animals died in the production of my meal. Normally, that's a requirement, you know? <laughs> and so she has single-handedly rescued your reputation for hospitality. <laughs> We began last afternoon with the consideration of the old path of transformation. We were thinking there of the birth of the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2. And we were considering there how the early church, in the midst of uh, revival, really, was this outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, overcame those believers and converted thousands more, how the early church committed itself to a rather simple program for organizing itself to make disciples and for informing and structuring those disciples um, in, in the faith, and just simply committed to the teaching of God's Word, the fellowship of sharing with one another, eating together, uh, and what's the four? The prayers. Just checking to see if you're with me. <laughs> the prayers. And we wanted to suggest that that old path of transformation is really as useful today as it was a couple thousand years ago. And I want to encourage you in this. I've been thinking since last night, one of the gentlemen mentioned the fact that less than 3% of the UK would regard itself as Christian. And I know when viewed from the vantage point of the Christian, the, the really great Christian history um, of this part of the world, that, that may feel like a significant loss, like the Lord has been removing the candlestick. But let me just sort of point out from Acts 2, and that 3,000 who were converted really were 3,000 of what would have been around, scholars tell us, 180 to 200,000 people in Jerusalem around that time of the festivities. That's about 1 to 2%. It's about the size of the Christian population of England right now. I'm left to believe that if the Lord would turn the world upside down with uh, 3,000 such souls beginning there in Jerusalem, he'd be pleased to take 3% of the U.K., and turn the world upside again, down again with the gospel. Commit it to those old paths. Well, today we want to add to our thinking a neglected path of transformation. A neglected path. It's as old as the first, but for reasons that we'll consider as we work through Titus chapters 2 and 3, I want to suggest to you that it has fallen into disuse. It's fallen into neglect, and the recovery of this path will go a long way in transforming God's people and His church, and if He blesses it, will go some ways in transforming our communities and the people that we call neighbors. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, down to the end of chapter 3, I want to hang our thoughts on three points. Number one, God wants a people zealous for good works zealous for good works. 
verses 11 to 14 of chapter 2. Number two, the pastor must model, teach, and insist on good works. Must model, teach, and insist on good works. Verse 15 of chapter 2 down to chapter 3, verse 11. And number three, the doing of good works is the secret, the neglected path to fruitfulness and transformation in the church and beyond. Doing of good works is this neglected path of transformation that we want to consider. So let's, talk, let's start with that first point there. God wants a people zealous for good works. You see that there in verses 11 to 15. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to, say, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Paul starts here, or our text starts here with this marvelous summation of the gospel. These beautiful words. The apostle tells Titus and tells us that the grace of God has appeared. I'm referring to the incarnation of our Lord, the entrance in bodily form of all of that beneficence, all of that charity, all of that goodness which defines the Father's heart toward his people. It's been enfleshed, it's entered time and space. And it makes it clear that this is not the common grace of God, the kindness of God that he shows toward all of his creation when he makes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous or the rain to fall on all of creation. But this is the special saving grace of God. See how Paul puts it there in verse 11. This is the grace that brings salvation for all people. The remarkable thing about this grace is that it not only saves those who believe, but God's saving grace also trains. It teaches the believer. You might think of God's grace and this way of training as a, the way you think of perhaps your athletic trainer or your dietitian. You know, those trainers only have two words in their vocabulary, right? No and more. <laughs> everything that's tasty in life, meaning everything that has sugar, they say, no, no, you can't have that, right? And just when you're tired of of getting those reps and your muscles are failing, they stand over you and they bark, one more, one more, one more. They're training us. And so this grace, it, it barks at us, no, when it comes to ungodliness and worldly passions. Renounce that. Stay away from that. And in the voice of this spiritual trainer, it, it says more, do, do more, one more rep of godliness and self-control and uprightness. Yes, I know the world is dark, but more, more pursuit of Christ. That's what God's grace is doing in this text. In verse 12, God's saving grace trains us. It whips us into spiritual shape. God employs those same two vocabulary words of no and more. And God, God's grace trains us this way so that we might, notice, have endurance, right? For our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Paul would not have us be fooled. We need to be trained this way because waiting is such hard work. One of the most difficult spiritual exercises you will do is wait on the Lord for that answer, for that relief, for that guidance, for that resolution of conflict, for some kind of answer to prayer. And waiting is not inactivity. It is a hard spiritual exercise. 
And this is why we must be trained to live clean so that we can endure until we, we get that final thing we're waiting for, that greatest thing we're waiting for, the, the appearing of our, our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, when his Shekinah shall split the sky and, uh, and, and his, his brilliance shall invade time and time itself will give way to eternity and seeing him in his glory at that very moment, we will be transformed into the glory we behold. It's our blessed, our happy hope. All the world around us is dark with sin, but we look yonder for that breaking light in the face of Jesus Christ. But there's something I want us to note about this paragraph. See how it ends. Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And I think in Many minds, many, many Christian minds, the, the sentence almost trails off at that point. And, and we almost imagine that that's the, the complete thought. Christ has died for us. He gave himself up for us on the cross. And by that act of self-giving and mercy, Christ has redeemed us. He's bought us back from the slavery of sin, and he has made of us now a, a new people, a reconciled and forgiven and justified people through faith in him. And, and he has done that so that we, we might belong wholly to him and to God our Father. And in many respects, the work of the cross kind of ends there. Only it doesn't. Notice the sentence. It says here, to purify for himself a people, yes, for his own possession, yes, who are zealous for good works. The transformation of the gospel does not begin and end with forgiveness and justification. The transformation of the gospel continues outward in lives that are zealous, that are fervent, that are eager to do good. It's not that the gospel produces a people who sometimes do something nice. It's that the saving grace of God in the gospel produces a people who are burning and yearning to always be doing good in the world. Zealous for good works is another way of describing a, a transformative impulse. Having been changed by God through faith in Christ having gone from ungodliness and worldly passions now to self-control and uprightness and godliness, the, the people of God now learn through the grace of God a passion and a fervency for doing good. God has been good to us, and that leads us to be good in the world. So let me ask you this question, beloved. Have you ever been taught to be zealous for good works? Have you ever been taught that one reason God saved you was because He wants you to be zealous for doing good in the world? Has there ever been a point in time where perhaps an older Christian sat with you and worked out in your life personally the implications of Ephesians 2.10? That God has prepared good works for you beforehand, that you should walk in them. Has that kind of instruction ever resulted in a practical, particular plan for how you with fervency and zeal will pursue the doing of good? See, I suspect a great many of us have not been taught that. That's why I call it the neglected path of transformation. I'm afraid that Christian church has neglected something essential in God's sight. We've neglected that something God wants in all of his people. Zeal for doing good. It's not an afterthought in God's mind. It's part of his purpose to now use us to reflect his glory in the doing of good. We're, we're off the path of transformation if we imagine that we can be true gospel people, saved for God, and yet indifferent to good works. And so far from indifferent, we must actually become zealous. That's what God wants from us. Fervency, eagerness, zeal in the doing of those things that are marked by goodness, wholeness, purity, righteousness. 
It's what his saving grace trains us for. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, your personal life, your church's life, how would you rate it on this scale, one being least, ten being highest, of zeal for good works? What keeps you from being a ten? What keeps you from burning with zeal as God wants you to in the doing of good? But now we move on. So the people are saved for this purpose, to do good, to be zealous for doing good. God wants a people for his own possession who are marked by that. Well, how does a church become that? This transformation of of having been saved because of the goodness of God and that working itself out in the doing of goodness in, in God's name. How does, that, how does that transformation get carried out practically in our lives and in our congregations? And how does it go beyond our congregations to the lives and the surrounding lives around us, the communities around us? Well, number two, the pastor must model, insist, and teach this doing of good. We see that there stated in verse 15. Paul says to Titus, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. These things refers to, of course, the, the summation there in verses 11 to 14 as a whole. The, declare the grace of God. Declare the salvation of God. Declare the sanctification that follows and the, the glory of another world when Christ shall appear and the, and the purity, the holiness that God's people must share with him. And declare the good works that God calls us to. As the pastor, Titus is to make these kinds of things unavoidable to his, to his people. He's to, to preach and instruct in such a way that they're constantly sort of bouncing into this instruction of God's saving grace. He must encourage their doing it. As pastor, he must be both cheerleader and coach in all that God's grace requires of us. So notice there, from time to time, he must rebuke with all authority. The authority that comes from the ministry of the Word. Not any authority in and of himself, but, but that authority of God's voice written on the page in his Word. He must not be weak and timid or unsure. And on the other side, he must not be autocratic and abusive and domineering. But as a fellow servant, called to this same pattern of life, he must exhort all the others and instruct them to in the doing of good. If God commands these things, Titus there, notice the word, must insist upon them. It's a basic part of the pastor's job description. In the UK, you guys maintain a, a fairly proper decorum, a proper distance from one another. And you may be nervous with words like insist, but we Americans don't have any such nervousness, <laughs> especially Texans. You know, we insist on things all the time. We are rather bossy, brash people. You don't have to be like us. Please don't be like us. But do acquire this posture of loving and kind insistence that Christian people become all that God wants us to be. And I'm laying emphasis here on the zeal for good works. I said the pastor must model this. Let's you go back over to, to Titus chapter 1 and look there as Paul is instructing, or excuse me, Titus chapter 2, as Paul is instructing Titus what to teach the various groups in the church, the older men, the older women, the younger women, the younger men. Notice in verse 7, he comes around to Titus himself and he says this, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. For all of you who have training for the ministry or have completed some training course or perhaps have been uh, workers in the ministry for some number of years. I want you to think about the job descriptions and the, the advertisements you've seen for pastoral vacancies. Have you ever seen on a job description for a pastor a bullet point that says, must be a model in all respects of good works? might even be neglected in what we look for for pastors. 
Well, it's, it's not neglected here in the divine job description and God's own recording of, of the pastoral epistles and what he expects of pastors. Here it is said very plainly. We're not only to sort of teach these things by precept, we are to model these things by example. The very pattern of our lives is to be a pattern that if traced, results in the consistent and joyful doing of all kinds of good works. So this is not an option for us. This is both required of God's people and is required to be taught by God's pastors. Look back in chapter 3 again in verse 8 where Paul mentions this again. The saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful, notice, to devote themselves to good works. None of this language gives you the feeling of being optional, does it? Just be careful to devote themselves. I want you to insist on these things. You must be a model in all respects of good works. So doing good is a Christian lifestyle. It is a pattern of Christian living, not an option. The people are to be careful to devote themselves. It's a kind of holy scrupulosity here kind of holy examination of of self and conviction and principle and action, the doing of good. So our people should often be asking, Pastor, what good can I do? If that sounds like good news to you as a pastor, be reminded that we must always be at the ready to say, here, let me show you. To set them a model, to exhort them, to equip them, to prepare them for the works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Well, what kinds of good works does Paul have in mind here? Well, he gives us some representative examples in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. But these, these good works are really the, the flowers, we said before, of gospel transformation. We ought to be marked by these things precisely because God in the gospel has changed us. Notice how fluent Paul is between the, the sort of proclamation of the gospel, the indicatives of the gospel, the facts of the gospel, and how he moves over now to the outworking of the gospel. So, so seamlessly, he does it again there beginning in verse 3 of chapter 3. For we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Do you remember that part of your life? That's what we were. I certainly lost those things. Then but, verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but because of his own mercy, according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Before Christ, our lives were marked by sin. Our lives were the opposite of the good works of verses 1 and 2. The unfruitful works of darkness defined us. Then something decisive and irreversible happened. The goodness and loving kindness of God broke into our lives. It it appeared to us in the face of Christ. And that goodness and that mercy beckoned us. It called us in an irresistible call to come and be transformed. Christ saved us us. We did not save ourselves. We did not earn such salvation. We we could not demand such salvation. We could not flee the wrath of God in our own strength, hide from him by our works. Paul makes that clear in verse 5. We are saved by the finished work of Christ. In In his flesh, our Lord atoned for our sins In his earthly life, he obeyed the law of God in our place perfectly. And so our sinless sacrifice redeemed us for God. And we are brought to the Father by grace through faith in him and repentance from sin. 
Through Christ, God gave us the Holy Spirit who regenerated us and washed us. The Spirit gave us a new birth and a, a new life. He made us clean. We, we were not taken to the symbolic waters of ritual, ritual purification in the Old Testament system. We were washed by God himself, by him, his Spirit, who was poured out on us richly. We were bathed and cleansed as if we were standing at the, the foot of Niagara Falls or more more grand yet, Victoria Falls. And all the fresh water of God's cleansing rolled over us and made us new. Gave us the hope of eternal life and made us heirs together with Christ. A Christian is an exquisite creature. A Christian is a marvelous recreation. It's no ordinary mundane thing to have been so loved by God and purchased by Him and made to be like Him by His power. And that marvelous transformation comes to all who repent and believe. Perhaps you're here today and you've not yet turned to Christ as your Savior and your God. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of rebirth and renewal. Today is the day to be cleansed of sin and reconciled to God. Turn from your sins. Place your faith in Him. And He promises that all who call upon Him shall be saved. Beloved, if you're already a Christian, because of this transformation wrought in us by God through the person and work of Jesus Christ, we, we're called now to a life of good works, as we've been saying. This good work is not the root of our salvation, but the fruit of it as verse 5 makes clear. And so we hear verse 8 as gospel people. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And then Paul adds this. These good works are excellent and profitable for people. It means for us, I think, to understand that the works are not merely instrumental. And this reducing of good works to an a sort of means to an end, I think is one of the things that has inadvertently contributed to the shrinking of, of this aspect of the Christian life. It's not that we do these good things only as a way of then telling people about Jesus. We, we don't, for example, go to a homeless shelter or a, a place to serve meals to the, to the homeless and and we do that only as a way of requiring them now to sit and listen to us talk about the gospel. We, we must understand that the works themselves have their own excellence, their own value. The works themselves are intrinsically good. They bless people. And on that basis, too, we should commit to then doing them. I think it may be the case that evangelicals, concerned that as we are, that people not think that works are the grounds of our salvation, we have gone too far. We have perhaps from a kind of suspicion moved away from any emphasis on good works. And, and in doing that, we've moved away from the, the transformative vision of the gospel itself as we see it repeated for us in Titus. I mean, we have rightly sought to protect the gospel. But we have wrongly emptied the Christian life of its ethical imperatives to do good, to become suspicious of good works in the Christian life is to, is to love the sunshine but hate the warmth. It is to plant lovely English roses and despise their fragrance. It is somehow to embrace the gospel root of transformation and dislike the fruit of it. We need to recover the apostle's fluency here. His fluency with both the gospel and good works. In the, in the space of these 15 verses, Paul has written for us two of the most glorious summations of the gospel in the Bible. We see them there in verses 11 to 14. We see it again in verses 3 to 7 of chapter 3. He's even made certain to joust against any notion of works righteousness. That's good and right. But three times he exhorts the church to this transformative calling of doing good. Chapter 2, verse 14 people who are zealous for good works. Chapter 3, verse 8, or verse 1, be ready for every good work. Chapter 3, verse 8, 
I want to, you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good work. I want us to feel the pastoral responsibility of these texts. I want us to feel the concern we should have as Christians to devote ourselves to these things. So if we're here and we're pastors, we must insist on them. If we're here and we're Christian members, we must carefully devote ourselves. That's a long way from suspicion. That's really quite close to enjoyment. The Bible makes good works a, a kind of church-wide conspiracy. Between pi- pipe, between Piper, yeah, him too. Between pastor and people. So when is the last time, pastor or elder, you insisted someone do what is good? Mothers, fathers, when did you last carefully devote yourself to a life of doing good? Are our church members kind of on their toes, ready for every good work? Are they ready to as quickly pounce into good works as Lionel Messi may be ready to pounce into striking and scoring a goal or whoever you want to substitute? How will we let our light shine before unbelievers so that they see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven as Jesus taught if we are not taught and committed to doing good? It seems that our master in Matthew 5, verse 16 there, has a sense of the transformative power of his people being light and being salt and doing good and that redounding to the glory of God the Father, even in the lips of people who have not quite yet come to know him personally. That's transforming such works. Where's our commitment? Where's our plan? Have we worked that out? Which brings us to the final thing we wish to observe. You see it there in chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Paul continues to meditate in this section where he's given his final instructions and salutations. He says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And then here it is in verse 14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. It could be Paul has in mind good works aimed specifically at supporting missionaries and and gospel workers like the men that he lists there in verses 12 and 13. Or Paul could have in mind a, a wider field for doing good. In either case, the church's responsibility is clear. Verse 14 includes the same call to devotion that we saw in verse 8. And in verse 8, Paul focused in in part on the internal quality of of good works. They are excellent. And here in verse 14, the apostle seems to focus on the, the external value of such good works. Such works are the means for helping people in urgent need, and they are the means to fruitfulness in the Christian life. By learning to be devoted to good works, we we simultaneously help others among us and grow in the sense of fulfillment or fruitfulness. Good works bless the recipient and the giver. I have an impression that I'd like to test with you. I'm not sure it's altogether accurate, but I suspect it's not completely wrong either. The impression is this. A lot of Christian folks live with a chronic sense of being unfruitful or unneeded. I formed an impression based upon the Bible in part and on anecdotal experience. Biblically, I'm thinking of a passage like 1 Corinthians 12 where Paul uses the body analogy to talk about the the various parts of the body being unified in a whole. And you'll recall that there there were kind of two two attitudes that he had to encounter or or to challenge in the midst of describing the church as a body. There were those who who felt themselves independent. I'm an I. I don't need you lowly toes. And there were those who felt insufficient. 
Well, because I'm not an eye, I have no part in the body. And Paul, I think, points out that both are a peculiar sort of species of pride. And both are wrong in its assessment. That, that whether you are the visible upfront part that gets a lot of natural honor, or whether you are the sort of clothed part that we receive, that, that we give double honor to because it's modest and because we clothe it, in either case, you, you're both necessary to the body, to its function to its growth. And I think the Bible is telling us in so many words that there are people who struggle with this sense of of being unnecessary and unfruitful. But anecdotally, I think I see the same feeling of unfruitfulness or or feeling unnecessary in in actual people. I I remember uh, when one of my assistant pastors in my previous pastorate returned actually from the UK in a pastoral training program here, to begin his first days as a, as a new pastor. He was a son of the church and, and much loved by the church. And he came, and the humble man that he was, and he said, you know, hey, um, what, what tips you got for me? Give me some tips on being a pastor. I said, well, okay. I said, the first and most important thing for you to do is to learn how to use your diary, to learn how to schedule and plan your time. And, and he kind of graciously pushed back. As I said, a very humble man, very gentle man, never had a harsh bone in him, and But he kind of pushed back and he said, "Uh, you know, I kind of like to be flexible. You know, I I think the ministry is about flexibility. I want to be able to kind of do these things and do these things. I said, okay. Knowing that this wasn't my first rodeo. (laughs) And we'd have that conversation again. And sure enough, a few months later, he came in and he plopped down in the chair in front of my desk. And I looked up from my desk and we exchanged a few pleasantries about the day and the island. And, and, and then he says to me, he says, um, I need your help, boss. I said, well, what's going on? He says, uh, very humble. He says, uh, I don't know, man. He says, I don't, I don't feel fruitful. I said, really, what's, what's going on? He says, well, I just kind of feel like, you know, I'm doing some things, but I'm not always sure it's the right thing to do. And and people sometimes have expectations. I'm not sure they have the right expectations. And, and he went on to describe ways in which he felt like he was floundering. And I asked him about flexibility. <laughs> he still kind of liked it, but he was beginning to see that actually not having a plan for how he used his time and not having sort of a concrete agenda and calling it flexibility was part of what's creating in him this sense of being unfruitful and sometimes even unnecessary. From pastor to people, I mean, imagine some of the folks in your congregations. Imagine, for example, teenagers in your congregation who may be given the impression that Christianity is an adult sport. There's no place for a 13-year-old or 50-year-old in the Lord's church and uh, no, no meaningful roles for them to play. We may be unintentionally passing along to them a sense of dissatisfaction and unfruitfulness in their souls uh, and cultivating in them a kind of wanderlust, looking for meaningfulness and achievement. Or consider, for example, the, the older persons in your congregation. How many of them have been Christians for many years and, and may have sort of subtly gotten the impression that now as an older person they have aged out of usefulness? And they feel this gnawing unfruitfulness. This sense that they have more to give but no one to give it to. This sense that they still have vigor and life and would very much like to put the shoulder to the plow, but, but all the attention seems to be directed to younger persons with more vigor and more strength, able to push bigger plows. Or oh, think of the mom, busy with her young children, always wiping noses, always changing napkins, kissing boo-boos, making meals, doing bedtime, doing it all over again in a seemingly unending cycle. I love the way my wife describes motherhood. She says it's like putting pearls on a string with no knot at the bottom. (laughs) Isn't that great? (laughs) The beauty of it and the futility of it mixed together. And a young woman faithfully caring for her family, and yet feeling this gnawing sense that she needs more, wants to do more. 
with no, without at all diminishing the role of the home and the family, feeling as a Christian a call to contribute to the transformation of our church and our community, or a father who likewise feels that way. I wonder if our underemphasis on good works and our sort of failure to cultivate and develop actual practical strategies for employing people in doing good, I wonder if one of the poisonous fruits of that is this gnawing sense of being unfruitful and unnecessary. So when Paul says here, at the end of this letter, to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful, if I might paraphrase, I think he's saying, Timothy, if you pastor this church with a plan to employ every member in the useful works of Christian witness, you will have a church full of people not only meeting needs, but feeling that satisfaction and that godly success and feeling that sense of purpose that Christ means his people to have because after all, he saved them and made them a people for his possession, zealous for good works. Think of the many ways in which Christians have radically impacted societies. How they've gone about their, their work of doing good and and built institutions like hospitals and colleges. Those began in the same humble beginnings you may feel are typical of your church. We think of this land of the example of a George Mueller and the, and the orphanages that were run, fueled by faith and prayer, meeting urgent needs, and creating in those who served a sense of fruitfulness. We think of the missions endeavors that God's people have been called to, to, to go and to bear witness to Christ, yes, but also in many cases to, to serve the people to whom they've gone with, with medicine and education and other things. And how purpose and power and transformation have risen up out of such endeavor. Now, I don't think that Paul means the church in Crete pastored by Titus, as small as it likely was, exactly had the responsibility for transforming all of Crete's institutions and society. As I said before, the church in Jerusalem, which we considered last night, were, were 3,000 souls. And that sounds big from one perspective, but when you think of the numbers of people in Jerusalem, it's somewhere between 2 and 3%. Not, not big at all. But isn't that how the kingdom spreads? It's small at first. It's yeasty. It works its way through the whole batch of dough. But isn't that how God is glorified? It takes the things of this world that are powerless and the things that are nothing, and by those weak and powerless things, he upsets and confounds and outshines the powerful and the wise of this world. It isn't that you have to go back to Birmingham or you have to go back to a neighborhood in London or you have to go back up north somewhere and sort of launch a massive plan to take over the city council and to redistribute wealth and, and, and just take over all its institutions. No, it's that we have to go back to our places, back to where the Lord has planted us, and resolve in our hearts and with the instruction of the Word and the power of the Holy Spirit to do the next good thing the Lord lays before us. And in the accumulation of the next good thing and the next good thing and the next good thing, look up and see that our lives as pastor and people might be a pattern of good works. And then to discover in the full tapestry of God's time and providence and work that that, that pattern of good works has emerged as this wonderful embroidery, transformative of our hearts and our churches and to some extent our communities. That God has a way of taking those small investments and compounding them and making them great. Wouldn't it be wonderful to end our lives, to have our churches celebrate our lives and to remember us at our funerals, weeping the way the saints wept at Dorcas's passing, that godly older woman known for good works. And wouldn't it be marvelous to leave a legacy behind like that unnamed man in Luke 10, 25 or 37, that good Samaritan, who while he was on his way stopped to help someone and to be generous and had his story told, that parable recorded, 
for generations to come. I think that's God's call upon our lives, and I think it will transform more in our lives and our surroundings than perhaps we have thought. The simple act of doing good right where we are with people around us. Let us be zealous to do so. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would help us to escape the clutches of any spiritual apathy. We pray that you would help us to break the stranglehold of unbelief. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us an appropriate estimation of our smallness in the world, combined with a a prostrating of ourselves on your power and your greatness. For when we are weak and we're strong, your power abides on us. We pray that you would give us power by your Spirit, having saved us, to now live zealously, to do good, to be ready <coughs> at every instance, every turn, to do good. And in the doing of good, O oh Lord, that those those acts might prove to be excellent. They might be motivated by love. They might be spurred on by your gospel. And they might, Lord, be profitable for people and help people in urgent need. And even, Lord, give us a sense of purpose and satisfaction as we serve you and honor you with our lives. So help us not, O oh Lord, to flinch at our own weakness. Help us not to dream of being revolutionaries that change everything. We know that you could do that. But help us to be faithful, to do the next good thing until you make of our lives a tapestry of good works and until you display the embroidery of your providence and your goodness at work in us to the entire universe for the glory of your name. We want very much for people to see our good works and to praise our Father in heaven. Bring yourself praise, O oh Lord, through these feeble offerings, we pray. 